Hello, everybody. My name is Arthur Chapman. Um, welcome to the first of these provocations, so-called, uh, in history education. I'm just going to share a presentation with you. And the first thing it's going to do is tell you that I work at University College London, the Institute of Education. I'm a history educator. I've been working in history education as a teacher and as a teacher trainer and in various other roles uh, since, the, uh, since 1993. Um, what I'm going to be talking about in my presentation are the aims of school history. And I'm going to be arguing in an English context, because that's where I'm talking to you from. In fact, from the east of England is where I am located right now. I'm going to be arguing that um, our understanding of the purposes of school history is too narrow in England, that we need to broaden it. So that is really my contention. Um, I've started with this image because the image talks to many of the things I want to say, and I'll, I'll, I'll refer back to it as I go along. I took this very recently uh, in, uh, in the COVID lockdown, which is still going on over here at the moment. Um, and on, we are allowed, we were allowed, we're now allowed to go out more often, but we were allowed then to only take one exercise uh, period a day outside of our houses, unless we had to leave for other emergency reasons. And on one of those days, not long ago, I uh, went along an old Roman road. I was curious to know what was there and what I would see. And I encountered this scene, which I photographed. And as you can see, I think it's in many ways quite beautiful, or at least visually interesting. Uh, we've got, you know, blackthorn blossom, we've got beautiful blue sky, we've got green grass, and we've got this enig enigma kind of hidden away in the middle there. What it is, is it's a Second World War pillbox or defensive uh, installation uh, from which people could machine gun uh, people coming up or down that road. And there's a strange sort of juxtaposition of things there. We've got the Romans in the context of the Second World War, seen in the context of Covid, um, and in a way which has a certain aesthetic and that kind of talks to many of the ways in which we might think about the present and the past anyway to elaborate further so I've been talking over the years now since 2006 when I wrote this about the aims of history education and said many quite uh, conventional things really you know, history is important because it develops our understanding of evidence, for example. History is important because we need to know the big picture of the past if we're going to orient in time. Um, all of those things are true, and no doubt I would want to say them if there was more time. But I want to focus on the fact that we live in strange times. Here are two articles by Mike Davis, published in the New Left Review uh, in 2010, uh, in issue 61 and then in March, April 2020 in issue 122. And I put these up because they point to the strange times we're in, but also to the positionality of all accounts of them. As I said, these are in the New Left Review. They're not on Fox News. They're not on Trump's Twitter feed, right? Um, so we need one considering them to bear that in mind. But what they point to is the fact that we live in a new epoch, the Anthropocene, rather than the geological time period in which most of human history has unfolded. That ended in 2008 when the Anthropocene was declared. Since the Second World War, we've been in a new um, era, as it were, where the impact of human, human activity can be seen in the geology of the Earth. That is what was being reported by Davis in 2010, and he was thinking through the implications of that. One of the implications of it is the current COVID crisis. This is one aspect of the unfolding of the Anthropocene, and um, at least on one account anyway. And I think whatever we say about history education has to be adequate to the times that we're in, and has to address the fact that we are in uh, strange times. Okay, uh, what is the function of school education? Michael Shearer in this rather superb book, I think, models at least four. Uh, we have the notion that schools should be about inducting children into the ways of knowing and the bodies of knowledge associated with academic disciplines. Uh, they should learn geography, they should learn chemistry, they should learn physics, they should learn history, because these are robust, interpersonally objective, disciplined ways of knowing that yield powerful knowledge which allows you to operate in the world in an intelligent and effective manner. Who can argue with that? Um, another purpose might be the child-centered classic progressive purpose, Shiro says. Another might be the social reforming, campaigning, reconstructionist aim. 
And we can certainly see that in history, can't we? In the argument that the school curriculum must challenge historic injustices and, if you like, put the balance right by giving full accounts of the past, not just the accounts of the victors and their, um, you know, their agendas in, 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 uh, in framing narrative. So we need to be decolonial and challenge sexism as well and so on. Who could argue with that? Also as well, uh, you can think about the curriculum and also history in terms of you know kind of OECD type ideas that it should all be about you know competencies and serving the economy and developing competent citizens well I don't think anyone would argue they want schooling not to do that but what happens if you focus only on that is the question anyway my contention is that we are in the top left here too much at the moment in England it's an excellent place to be robust historical knowledge and robust historical knowing are absolutely important but it is insufficient, I want to argue, to focus only on that. If we do that, we miss a lot. Uh, I want to put question marks over the kind of opposition that's usually used to frame that. People say, oh, I skew all instrumental uses of the past. I don't really care whether it serves this or that agenda. It's really important in itself. Um, I don't really accept that. Here is why. We have a continuum rather than a binary, and there is therefore overlap. There is therefore gradation along the way. Jorn Reason, in his superb work uh, on the aims of history and history didactics, Jorn Reason, of course, is a philosopher, but also a historian and also someone who takes an interest in history education. Mm -hmm. Jorn Reason has argued that what all, all right, attempts to construct knowledge of the past serve to do is orient us in time. I think Rusin is right, and I think what that does is render an inseparably practical aspect of uh, human living into the DNA and fundamental structure of history. You cannot get rid of practical orientation as one function of history. If you do, what are you left with? Um, so, in other words, what historians do is they answer questions about time. You know, how long has such and such thing existed? Where did it come from? You know, through what processes it developed, what was it like to be living in those times as opposed to these and so on, these sorts of questions. And what Rusin says is all of these are driven by the human need to adjust to and understand time and change, finitude, limitations, the fact that nothing any of us know will last forever. Everything will disappear, everything has a time, comes out of a time and will run out of time. This is the basic human predicament. And because of that, history is absolutely essential. We are bound to time. We must understand temporality. But that is something which is eminently practical. It's linked to everyday needs, to concrete examples of human psychology and so on and so on and so on. It's not sequestered off in a separate part of our lives. Um, the other thing I want to argue is that we need to consider the various ways and the various modes in which we think about time. Herman Poole does this really, really well in this superb book from 2015. Uh, Poole takes us through uh, moral relationships to the past. We mentioned um, the social reconstruction, for example. There's an inescapably moral aspect to that. Um, it's all about you know, trying to address injustices in how we think about time and change in society. Um, but there are also other moral ways of thinking about time. You know, are you obliged to to, 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 do we owe reparations, for example, because of slavery? And are people now in Western countries, England, Denmark, Holland and so on, uh, Portugal, uh, Spain, are they morally obliged for the actions of their ancestors? That is a, a moral question about time. There's a whole spectrum then uh, of ways of thinking about time and change and the past. And my contention, really simply, is that we must focus on developing rigorous, robust academic knowledge about the past. We must teach children to understand how we come to know about the past, what we know and do not know. But we must also help them to understand the manifold ways in which the past figures in the present. We must help them to compare, critically appraise, understand and engage with the full range of ways in which the past is presented or made present in the now. If we don't, all we do is give them a critical ability to deal with a practice they won't come across very much, which is academic practice. OK, definitely we need what's on the left here. This is an example of really superb scholarship in history 
by actually the ornithologist uh, Jared Diamond, uh, by training anyway, but this model is used to account for the Colombian exchange, for the fact that certain countries in the world are rich now and others are not. This is what this diagram is trying to do. Um, so it do deals with massive, large scale uh, civilizational uh, factors in human history, but it also provides a context for understanding day to day encounters in, in the book Diamond writes about, you know, the, the day on which the uh, Montezuma encounters the conquistadores and so on. So what I'm trying to say with this is certainly children need to learn how to account for change in, the, in time, over time, uh, at the large scale but also the small scale and our education in history must enable that. If we haven't done that, we haven't taught them any history. But I also want to say that we need to help them to critically think about the stuff I'm now going to show you. I'll just zip through it quickly. Here we have a plaque commemorating a massacre that took place in Manchester in 1819. If you read it, we haven't got time to think about it for too long, uh, you'll see that it doesn't even use the word massacre. It explains a certain it embodies rather a certain political understanding of what happened. Uh, even the grammar um, is interesting in terms of where agency is or is not located. Um, and it's really interesting that this was only put up in 1972. Uh, why was there such a big gap between the event and the commemoration, if that's what this is? Really interesting also is the fact it didn't last very long. 72, and here we have, I think, 2007. And even this is now replaced. And if you look at the language here, you'll see a very different orientation towards the event, a very different politics of it, a very different moral sense of it. Um, and both of these are now replaced by yet another um, commemoration, this time with a proper uh, monument rather than just a small plaque. And this raises all sorts of questions about the politics of representation, the presencing and absencing of the past the way that the past is, is, is brought in to discussions of identity or kept out um, as it was until 1972. What's going on there? History education should be about that, as well as about the analytical and critical um, explanation of time and change and so on that Diamond enables us to do. It should also enable children to understand the difference between this, a robust research-based superb monograph by the leading historian of Peter Lee, in my opinion, um, and this, a film almost contemporaneous with it, we've got 2019 for the book, 2018 for the film, uh, both of which cluster around this memorial. But think about it and think about the events and orient towards the events in very, very different ways. The film, without putting too fine a point on it, is pretty much, you know, framing the upper class as the enemy. Uh, and it was criticised for doing that uh, in a really rather two dimensional way. But nevertheless, it's very accurate in all sorts of ways, you know, uniforms and so on, thoroughly researched. Um, and of course, you know, the, the picture of the event itself is, is very thoroughly thought through. So these are two very, very different ways of thinking about this event at the time of a, a memorial. And we should enable children to explain how and why these things differ. Not only that, though, we've got, if you like, you know, more a wider range of popular cultural pres presentations of the past. Here we have a graphic novel, as it happens, robustly researched and, and, and collaborated with hist historians and uh, Peter Lee Memorial campaigners and uh, who are also cartoonists. So we've got um, you know, multiple overlapping issues here about different forms of presentation. Children should be able to think about that. What's the difference between using this genre? What are the purposes that will be embodied in using this genre? How does it differ? And also, how is it similar to the academic books, for example, in the film? The same historian is present in this, Robert Poole, and also in the monograph. Um, and also thinking about audience purpose and function. So the, the, the graphic novel is uh, for adults, but here is the school's version, uh, very different in its mode of narration. What's going on there? I think a public understanding of the past enables you to posit and discuss fundamental shifts and changes in the past itself. In other words, to do the stuff on the left, the robust, rigorously theorised academic history. But it also involves understanding these different uses of the past in the present. 
thinking about them comparatively and intelligently, not dismissively. You know, to talk about the plaque as if it was a bad history book is simply erroneous. You know, what is going on there? It's political, uh, it's moral. It's not simply uh, trying to produce robust, interpersonally validated claims. And again, you know, what is the difference between the film of the past and the, the other forms of memory we can see here? OK, in a nutshell, that's really what I'm arguing. We need to broaden the way in which history education addresses the past. It is really vital that we have a robust knowledge of the past, but it is also vital that we have a developed and robustly thought through understanding of the different ways in which we can come to know. That doesn't just mean show me your evidence and your footnotes. It means what is it when you want to have knowledge of the past framed aesthetically, morally, politically, analytically, and so on. Hopefully that'll provoke some debate. Thank you so much.